guess it's about time that we uh, get started. I'm not sure. I'm afraid there might be a lot of questions and discussion afterwards, so we may as well take uh, some advantage of the time we have this year. Uh, my name is Clark Baker. I'm from Massachusetts, and this is Pat Grimes from Texas. Is that right? Right. Good. Um, <laughs> the topic for today is kind of anything that has anything to do with computers and how they might be used as part of your square dancing business, choreography, um, anything. Um, I guess that just as, a, as some of a disclaimer, I work for a computer company. Uh, the computers I sell are $85,000 each. I'm sure you wouldn't want to buy one, so you shouldn't worry about me trying to sell you the, the thing that I do. Um, and, and also, currently, I don't have a PC at home, um, and so I'm not necessarily the best person to ask, should I get the IBM PC or the Apple IIe or the Macintosh or whatever, although I have been trying, I felt that my job at this uh, session was to talk to as many dancers who have computers and find out what they're doing and what works for them and try to convey that to you. So that's kind of what the list I've compiled. Um, I sent out a request in the direction for a, uh, anybody who does anything with square dancing computers. I got uh, some responses from that, and I've talked to a lot more people here who either didn't have the time or whatever or were afraid to, to call me or write me. And um, there's a lot of people who have some sort of personal computer at home or that they have access to as part of their work, and I think that most of them feel that they've had some part of their uh, calling activity helped by that and that it is worth doing the things they're doing and that it does save them time. Um, I was going to let Pat go first and then try to fill in the cracks where I had other ideas and so forth. So I'll turn it over to him. Ah. Thank you, Clark. Uh, my interest in computers goes back a considerable number of years. I worked for 35 years for a major oil company and uh, elected to retire about a year and a half ago. But in 1956, I helped install the first computer and uh, kind of grew up in the industry. I'm not, uh, my background was basically business. The youngsters today, like Clark, are all computer science majors and they know the bits and the bytes and everything. I, I knew some practical applications for computer use in a, in a large corporation. So my, my background was, was large computers that would uh, fill rooms several times this size. Uh, as I said earlier, I retired about a year and a half ago. Uh, the energy industry took a nosedive, and they were trying to get rid of as many of us overpaid uh, people as possible. So they made me an offer, and I quickly jumped at it. And I, my wife says, well, what are you going to do? I says, I'm going to play golf, and I'm going to call square dances and dance a little. And she says, what about a computer? I says, well, my plan is really to go starting out from Houston, going out west. And every town I stop at, I'm going to ask if you have a computer. And the first one that says, what's that? That's where we're going to stay. <laughs> As you, because if you fought the frustration not only of a major corporation politics, but uh, having management that wants the latest in computer technology installed, and the frustrations of trying to be a pioneer, and all pioneers do are get errors in their back. Uh, I didn't really want any part of a computer. As uh, as spring approached last year, and we made plans to go to Philadelphia, my wife uh, had been bugging me to get a computer at the house. She said, look, you know more about computers and anybody else I know, and we ought to have one at the house. And I said, well, what are we going to use it for? She said, well, you'll find things to use it for. And she, uh, at the present time and for the last three years, has been membership chairman of a rather large organization. So she has membership records on about 1,500 to 2,000 ladies in Harris County that, that play golf and uh, enter tournaments and so forth. And, she, and I watched her laboriously keeping all these manual records, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we could uh, get a computer for that. Then I came to Caller Lab in Philadelphia, and I heard Clark's talk on how he was using a computer, and I, it whet my appetite again. I, you do get tired of playing golf every day. I didn't think I would, but, but you do. 
So I, I went back to Houston to, to look around and determine just what kind of computer we ought to have at the house. And I talked to people that had worked for me before and that were... In having a large computer installation, you think, well, they, they won't have any PCs or small computers spread in the office, but there became a proliferation of those, mainly because of the service the large computer was not providing. So a young man that used to work for me was put in charge of the project of, of determining what kind of computers that uh, Gulf Oil ought to have other than the mainframe. And So I counseled with him. I went out and bought his lunch and picked his brain. And he said, he uh, gave me a couple of ideas. So I, I began looking around, and I found a number of people that were willing to sell me a computer. <laughs> Boy, just any store you walk into, you know, sure, I'll sell you a computer. I said, well, now I want to do mailing list, and I want to do this, and I want, oh, yeah, you can do all that. I said, well, how does it work? Oh, it works good. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, that is uh, the uh, the main thrust of the, of the computer store. I'm not picking on any single one. Uh, they all seem to be that way. So I went back and talked to my friend, and I said, man, I can't find anybody. And I said, you don't have time to train me to think small. He says, that's your problem. You're thinking small. He says, in a small desktop computer now, you have more power than you had in 56 or 60 or in a whole room full of equipment. But he, he gave me the name of uh, uh, one individual, so I went over and talked to him and found him to be very knowledgeable in, in what I wanted to do. So I selected my computer, and I went home and began to play with it. And... Uh, the first thing I did was put my wife's membership records on, and that gave me a background to, to produce mailing lists and everything for now two square dance clubs and, and a variety of other uh, organizations that I call for or work with. So I do have a, a lar rather large mailing list. My calendar is kept in the computer. The, the particular computer that I selected had a, a scheduling package built in so that I can just call up a schedule and enter a date. And then if I want to print an itinerary, I just give it a from date and a to date, and I get a, a printout of an itinerary. And it certainly does keep you from... Uh, and that is a, that's a law. Even though my wife, I tell her she's my uh, recording secretary and, and handles all my bookings, the computer is a law. If she books a dance and doesn't enter in the computer, then she has to call and explain to them why uh, the mix-up was. So the computer has become the, the law as far as as the calendar is concerned. I'm not a, a challenge caller or an advanced caller. I have a, a Friday club that we dance mainstream two nights a month and plus two nights a month and specials on the fifth. So, uh, but I pride myself in being a, a good teacher. At least I think I am until I talk to, to some other people. But I, I look around the floor. I've been calling for now 20 years, and I look. I go to a festival or something, and I see dancers that I taught years ago. They may not be dancing with me today, but they're still in the program, which is important to me. So I use, uh, among other things I have on my computer, I have uh, a choreography index. I subscribe to a couple of note services and take a couple of magazines. And, uh, and it's impossible to remember, at least for me to remember, where... I saw material or the description of a certain movement. So one of the first things we do after we go through the magazine is enter any calls that are described in a magazine or note service and the, and the location so that if somebody comes up and says, how do you uh, do motorcycle? Well, I can go back down through and find it, and I say, well, maybe we'll workshop that on a fifth Friday special or something to give you a little variety. So I do have an index of the note services in the magazines. Uh, I sometimes enter unique choreography. If I go to a dance, my wife and I go to a dance, and we belong to two clubs where we can just go dance, I think it's important that callers dance. And uh, But I, I'll steal choreography. I told a guy the other night, a caller that's too proud to steal choreography, he's got no business calling. <laughs> so I will go home and I'll enter that in the, in the computer with a keyword to, to locate it for me. I uh, keep up with all my income and expense, in which IRS insists that we do, and uh, 
particularly income. They're not so concerned about expenses, but they want to make sure that all the income is accounted for. And then uh, in you, I use it extensively in teaching. I, I, try to, I try to make sure that the dancer is at least exposed to unique ways. As, as callers, we get in a rut. We call certain repetitions and they just become habit and my wife says she can walk in a hall and not recognize the name but hear a few phrases and almost tell you who's in Houston's calling or, or the traveling callers that come through. So we do get repetitious and we get in a rut, so to speak. So when I'm uh, preparing a lesson for the class, I go through and I select certain the movements I'm going to uh, teach I go through the note services and find unique ways of putting that stuff together so that the dancers are at least acquainted with that you can do it from a, of a different position than all. And uh, we're having a workshop, of course, I go through and I, I select material to be used. I think the, the one thing that's helped me more is a result of uh, the Philadelphia Caller Lab and Clark's paper on the uh, analysis of, of calls. And uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. I want to back up just a little bit. In uh, since I had quite a bit of experience in computers, I found people would come up to me at a square dance and, and at the country club and say, "Hey, I'm going to buy a computer. What kind should I buy?" So uh, I said, "Well, the first thing, and that's a message I'd like to get across to this group: if you do not have a computer, don't go buy one." shop around and determine what determine in your own mind what you want to do with that computer find the software or the programs that are going to do the job that you want done and then go buy the hardware the mistake most people make is they run down to the, to the neighborhood store and they buy a computer and they get it home and I know several people where it's just sitting over in the corner they say man that's too complex I can't use that thing and I, I have developed a, a little clientele now, and I, I do some consulting now. I've gotten kind of back, my interest in computers has, has picked up with the power and the capability of these small systems. So I, I now have a, a few people that are, are beginning to pay me for my advice. So that kind of supplements the pension. But back to the analysis of calls. Clark made a, a very extensive study working with Jim Mayo and some of them up in the east of how many times he called a particular movement at a dance. So I, I went back home and after I got my computer, that's the first thing I did for myself was to record a few dances. And, and uh, that's a shock too when you find out how bad you sound. But... Uh, I had done that previously, but only to listen to certain things. But now I was entering every call in a computer. And uh, I had to develop a shorthand because I, my typing skill is not as good as it should be. So I developed a shorthand where I could enter every call in a computer and analyze, then sort down and get the frequency of calls. And I uh, quickly found out what some dancers had been telling me, that I wasn't very creative and didn't have very much variety in my programs. And I, I do not record every dance anymore, but I record about once a month, I'll record a, one month I'll record a mainstream dance and the next, stream, uh, next month I'll record a plus dance. And I'll go home and I'll put it in the computer and analyze it and compare it to what I did before. And my dancers seem to be having more fun. They stand later to dance. The crowds are somewhat larger than they have been in the past, although the classes down the, the Friday night dances seems to be better. So in talking to Clark on the telephone, I said, that system has helped my calling, and that's the one thing that I want to stress at, at Caller Lab is that an idea I picked up from Clark is working. And... Uh, as an aside, I, I let my wife enter a lot of the data now. At first, I was entering all the data, but now I let her enter it so that I can justify paying her a salary so she can have an RA at the end of the year. But that's an aside. But uh, really, uh, the point is, a computer is only a tool, just like a microphone or an amplifier or a record. 
the computer is only the tool and the use of that tool is is what makes it work and uh, I guess that's about all I'd say right now and Clark I'm sure he's going to talk more about this analysis of, of calls I don't want to steal his thunder because it's his idea and I'm not going to plagiarize it even though I'll steal his material I won't steal his program <laughs> <laughs> I have some handouts, um, so if you haven't picked one up, there's a couple up front, there's some more in the back, there's 99 of them all told, so grab one before someone else gets it. Um, I think most of you got one on the way in, but there's still some people who, who came in a little bit late. Uh, as long as most people are here now, something we asked last year that I think surprised uh, some Color Lab members was how many people in here today have either a computer at home or relatively free access to a computer at work that, that, well, let's ask it two ways. How many people have a computer at home or a computer at work that they currently do something that helps them in their square dance activity? So you guys already know everything, right? Okay, so what's that? That's a, that's a reasonable number of people. Um, and how many people here are looking into buying, let's say, some sort of personal computer for home use in the next two years? So, okay. Good. Um, see, I wrote some other uh, notes down here just while Pat was talking. Let me see if I want to hit any of these right now. Um, let me say again, I really agree with, with what Pat said with respect to if you don't have a computer, first figure out what you want to do with it, then go out and make sure you have the software, you know, talk to the guy at the computer store and make sure that, that, that the computer can really that you can find the software for you to do what you want, and then you can figure out what hardware you need to buy. Um, another way of doing it, which is I think what most people are doing, is go find a caller who's doing what you want to do, and you can duplicate what he's doing or ask him where he made mistakes and how he'd do it differently if he had it to do over again. Um, I think it's really great to have someone nearby who you can ask questions of who's a little more knowledgeable than you are. Um, Okay, on the sheet that I handed out, I had a whole list of, of just applications that I wanted to go down and, and make sure that people knew that they were both possible and, and that other people had done them and felt they were worthwhile. There's a lot of different sizes of computers, um, how much memory they have, how much disk, how fast they are. Um, different applications require different sizes of computers. Um, finally, there's the things you can do just by going to the computer store and buying some software like mailing lists and databases and, and um, word processing and that kind of stuff. And there's the stuff that you can't buy in a computer store because no one knows about square dance choreography and is going to write a package and, and sell it commercially. Um, so starting with the more easily done, more readily obtainable applications um, and then maybe working on into some of the things where you're going to have to either program it yourself or find someone else to program it for you or find someone who's done it before. Um, but let's kind of cover things in that order. Uh, and before I get into that, is there any questions right now, something I've missed or anything like that? Anybody has? No. Okay. Um, well, just going down the way I have it, uh, and, and Pat mentioned some of these. Uh, well, Oh, finally, if you turn the paper over on the back, there's a list of about 10 callers. Um, and these are the people who responded to my request for information, either on the phone or, or when I talked to them. And I tried to just summarize what I got out of talking to them, what they used the computer for, what works for them, what kind of computer they have in case people are interested. Um, probably you could go talk to one of these guys. I've probably talked to another dozen people since I've been here who, who I should add to the list. Um, okay, so... Address lists. Um, that's a relatively simple application. Computers are good at that kind of thing. Um, if you take the time to type it in once, then you've got it there. It might be club members at your dance. Um, it might be um, just key contacts at, um, for all the clubs you call for. Uh, a lot of callers uh, run weekends. They have to keep track of how much money has come in, who's paid, uh, send out mail for flyers, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes they want to sort them by you know, alphabetical order so they can look things up easily. Sometimes they want it sorted by um, who hasn't paid, uh, kind of along the same lines. 
uh, I guess one caller I was talking to was interested in scheduling campsites and who wants to be near the other dancer at a particular weekend and then it changes around throughout the year and are any campsites occupied by more than one dancer and that kind of stuff. So it's almost campsite scheduling um, as opposed to caller scheduling for a convention. Um, so that's address list. It sounds, when I was writing this up, I kept on saying to myself, but this sounds so simple and mundane and you've got to do it and is it really saving the guy time? Um, and everybody I talk to says address list. I use that, and it really saves me a lot of time. I put out a note service. I put out, um, uh, I send out tapes, and I have to keep track of who gets them or any of these things. And it really does save them time. I think they do feel that it's it's worthwhile. Um, you can buy address mailing list programs from uh, a lot of the software people for most of the computers, so it's not a big deal. You don't have to worry about the programming part of it. And I want to come back and say something more about databases in case I. Uh, Miss it. Okay. Some computers keep their Square Dance calendar on the computer. Ah. Some callers keep their Square Dance calendar on the computer. Uh, I had some problems with this, just in wondering, again, is this really worthwhile? When I'm at a dance, I can write it down in my calendar, which I carry with me and so forth, and I don't have the computer next to me. I don't take the computer with me everywhere I go. Um, and, and is it really worth it? But a lot of the guys I talked to said, oh, whenever they call up, I just punch in the date, ask it what dance I'm calling that night, you know, June 13th, 1986. And if it says nothing, then I'll enter it for them. And if it says something, I can say, I'm sorry, I'm calling for somebody else. Um, when the, the current month, at the beginning of the month, he'll run off a list of all the dances that, that he's got to call that month so he can just see what's going on. Um, if he's traveling, and maybe you're going to call, for example, if you live in Boston, you want to call in Long Island, you know you can't call the night before because you're going to be traveling that day or something. He'll put two entries in, one for the real dance and one saying I'm on the road or something like that. Uh, again, to me it sounded rather simple and mundane, but and, and potentially it sounded like, am I really getting enough payback from typing in my calendar? But people do it, and people seem to feel it's worth it. Uh, and there's one other point to come back on calendars. Uh, hold on for one sec. Let me just write this down. Uh, calendars and uh, mm -hmm. travel. Okay, we'll get back to that. Um, Accounting is the big area where I guess even I use it and I find it worthwhile. The first thing everyone says is, well, I type in all my income, I type in all my expenses. And my usual question is, will you do that every day? Do you do it at the end of the month, at the end of the week, or what? And most people seem to say, well, at the end of each month, I just type in everything. I get a summary of how much money I made that month, how much, what my expenses were that month, and these are the records I need for when I'm filling out my income taxes. Um, some callers have more of a business than just the calling part of it. Maybe they're, they're running weekends, they're running a note service, uh, they're selling books, they're doing um, uh, caller schools things like that where the accounting might get a little more complicated and, and they find it, it saves them even more time there. There are some programs that will help you figure out your taxes that, that run on, on computer, home computers, personal computers. I haven't used one of these. You always wonder, well, doesn't it change every year and you have to buy a new one every year? And from talking to people who have used them, they say, well, they often provide updates for you so that you buy it for some, you know, 50 or 100 bucks, whatever it costs you first, and then every year you can get updated for 20. Um, if you're really good, you can get the data that you store just for entering income and expenses every week or month um, automatically to go over into the program to help you calculate your taxes, and that would be a real win. I didn't talk to many people who had done that. Most people had said, yeah, I know I can buy a tax program for my computer, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, and... And I don't think they thought that it, it wasn't worth it. They just hadn't done it yet. Uh, okay. A lot of the letters I received when I asked people, gee, do you have a computer, came all nicely printed out on a word processor. Uh, I used, I prepared this handout on a word processor. I certainly checked the spelling, although there might be spelling mistakes, and, and I changed it. It's really just an updated version from last year's handout where I added new information to it and changed it around a bit. Um, I think a lot of callers are notoriously bad with correspondence and everything. I'm not sure if the word processor helps, but, but it, it might help a bit. 
and and just in doing anything where I write letters or prepare handouts or something, um, and I like to give my dancers handouts just when I'm teaching them stuff on what the calls are or what we did last week or something like that. I Not everyone learns the same way, definitions and so forth. Um, and some people like to see it written down. Um, I think just the word processing aspects where I can change something I've typed in before and I don't have to retype and I don't have to worry about making typing mistakes. I can get it printed out so it looks nice, it looks professional. Um, that helps a lot. Okay. Um, number five is a point that I didn't mention last year. How many people were here last year when I gave kind of the same spiel? Am I? Okay, so most of you haven't heard this. There, I'm a challenge caller and dancer. Um, there's a bunch of other challenge callers and dancers around the country who I'd like to communicate with. We have a lot to talk about, things like, oh, there's this new call that I heard that Lee did it this weekend, and do you know how it goes, and did he really do it from there, and what does he mean when he says this, and, and so forth. Um, or I was doing a um, Dave Hodson tape, and you know we got this on it, and they do the same tapes, so I can talk about the same problems that they had. Uh, or there's a weekend coming up and we're all going up to Canada for a weekend and, and, and so forth. So I want to communicate with all these people. A lot of them have either a computer terminal at home or a home computer which can be used as a computer terminal by using a modem hooked up to their phone. And at work, when I was over at MIT, I had access to a network of all the people who do contract work for the government. And I could just send mail and messages off to my friends. And there's an amazing number of even square dance friends who were on that network. But since I've left that environment, I kind of lost access to that. Uh, there are some nationwide networks of computers that, for example, I mentioned the source in CompuServe. Um, I just happened to subscribe to CompuServe to see what it was like and because some of the other square dancers that I knew were doing that. And the idea is, is that for 10 cents a minute connect time, for me it's a local phone call, I can send mail, messages, and do whatever else the source, or I'm sorry, CompuServe allows me to do, but mainly mail and messages um, to all the other people who are on. And I can call up a friend and say, look, why don't you subscribe to CompuServe? All you got to do is, is buy the starter kit, um, get the local phone number, make sure you have a, a computer terminal or a personal computer and a modem, and you and I can communicate. And more importantly, if there's 20 of us on there, I can send one message and get to all 20 people, and they can send back responses and their ideas. Um, for some of the people who are running newsletters or uh, some sort of um, monthly, you know, here are the dances, and, and plus you want to include some letters and some editorial and maybe some, some comments, I discovered a little bit to my surprise that some message I'd replied to one of the people saying, well, my opinion on this is da-da-da, and lo and behold, the next time the publication came out, there it was, because they had taken that kind of as a submission to their, to their magazine and published it. I, I guess I was a little surprised at that, but fortunately I hadn't said anything I didn't mind seeing in print. Um, I think it would be really neat to have more and more people get on the computer network as I say, generally it's a local phone call. Yeah, you have a question. Uh, on CompuServe, are you just leaving a message on the breadboard? More or less effect, or are you communicating directly with uh, Okay, the question was on CompuServe, am I leaving a message on the bulletin board, or am I communicating directly with the people? Unfortunately, on CompuServe, I have to know I'm not leaving it on a bulletin board. Um, I am sending it specifically to each and every person. So I have a list of the ten people that I communicate with, um, I'll tell you how I found them in a minute. And I have to, just because of the way their mail sending program works, specifically say, I compose a message once. And I say, send this off to so-and-so. Send it off to this account. Send it off to that account. I have to go through the sending process once for each person. And that's very painful. And each person who receives the mail doesn't know whoever else saw it because that's kind of not listed there unless I include that as part of the message. For CopyServe also has a, a capability for a special interest group, of which square dancing doesn't count as one yet, but, but we're working on that, um, talking to some of the people there, where what you'd be able to do is send a piece of mail to the square dance interest group, 
and everyone on the score dance interest, interest group would be able to read that. And if you were brand new to CompuServe, it would say, well, you're new to the score dance interest group, and we've had 100 messages that we've talked about these things, and here's the topics. Would you like to see any of those? And then, you know, by the way, you'll keep getting future messages. And when you log in, it'll say, well, there's three new messages on the score dance interest group mailing list. Um, that's the way I'd like to see it work. I don't think it has to be on a public bulletin board, um, but yet I don't like this private. I have to address it to you and you and you. Now, the way I found out who was on here, and I discovered some new score dancers I didn't know, is when you get on to something like CompuServe, they say, um, let's have some personal information about you if you wish to enter it, like your name, um, what city you're in, what kind of computer you use, and what your interests are, and they let you type in three. And then there's a command that lets you go searching for people who have any interest you want to type in. So I tried all sorts of things. I tried square for searching for people. I tried square dance, all one word, square dance, two words. Dancing, I got a lot of people who didn't know about square dancing but did other types of dancing. Um, I tried computers, there are certainly a lot of those, that was a mistake. You know, do you want to see the 1,554 people who are interested in computers on this computer network or something? Um, I tried challenge, I tried challenge dancing. So one problem this points out is there was no uniformity about, well there's two things, there's no uniformity about what people entered for their interest even though they were interested in square dancing. That was number one. And number two, the searching command wasn't powerful enough that if I just kind of said square, it would find me everything that had square. And I think it was really matching for the whole word rather than just seeing if, if this word appeared anywhere in what the guy said. Um, but I found people. I found all the people I knew to be on there. Um, I guess that, that I probably know about ten people who are on there. And I found a couple of people who I had never heard of before or who I didn't even know they were on the network. And we're hoping to get more people on as time goes on. Um, getting back to the calendar thing, when I talked to people on the phone, I also asked them, I said, well, what about if they didn't use computer calendars? I said, well, what about, like, computer networks? Do you think there's any use in that? And they said, well, why should I, if I, if it costs me 10 cents a minute, wouldn't it be cheaper just to send a letter to the guy rather than um, sit there and type for 10 or 15 minutes and then, you know, pay all that money? And, and that one particular person couldn't see any utility to the computer networks and except for the following application which I thought was intriguing um, I'm not sure how practical it is let's say you're a traveling caller and you're going to be going in this area how do you book dances in that area how do you make sure that every night of the week is filled up and he said if the traveling callers would have an online calendar not that's on his computer but that's on to everybody and people can find out when this guy's busy and when he isn't busy and that he's going to be in their area at this time all electronically um, then they thought that might have some application for helping him get bookings and knowing when they're coming through. So they wanted to combine both computer networks and, and some sort of calendar thing. Um, I don't think there's any software or, or a way of doing that right now, but that's something that I listed on the, maybe in the future you can imagine this being one possible application. Uh, any other? Yes? On CompuServe, I'm uh, interested in cost to use of CompuServe. I understand it's a little based at Columbus, Ohio, and you mentioned... Ten cents a minute and local phone call. Is that local phone call anywhere? Okay, the question was um, the gentleman was interested in the cost of CompuServe. Um, they charge you, and I don't know how typical this is for something like the source, and there might be one or two net other ones that I'm not aware of, but CompuServe anyhow charges me ten cents a minute for connect time. And they publish a list of, I don't know, 500 or 1,000 phone numbers that you can call. And if it's a local phone call for you, you're in good luck. Boston or Cambridge or, or a lot of places in Massachusetts happen to be a local phone call away. And if you aren't a local phone call, then you have to pay the long distance call, you know, charges normally to wherever you call. And finally, for like Canadian people or um, people in remote places, there's a couple of other computer, um, not computer networks, networks where I can call this number here and a company will provide a service uh, you normally think of it as being um, like, what, Telpac or I forget what the, Datapack, yeah. Time and TimeNet and Datapack, right, Telnet. Wh Telnet, which will let you communicate from this city over to that city where you'll kind of connect into the computer. And they charge extra for that. Um, yeah, there's a surcharge for that. And there's also special services, which I don't make use of on CompuServe, like Dow Jones stock quotes and so forth, and they'll charge you per quote for something like that. But in general, um, it doesn't cost much to connect to it, and it may be a long-distance phone call. It may not. You'd have to check. Um, if you're interested, the way to get on CompuServe is you go into your local computer store and you buy a CompuServe starter kit for, I forget, 20 bucks, and that gives you an hour of 
quote, free computer time, although it's really $20 for the first hour, is what it comes down to. And using that time, you can explore it, and, and you can try, um, if you like it, you can give them your name and address, and they'll give you a real account that's permanent. Um, I thought it was an interesting way to market it. I tried to call up CompuServe and get them to send me information and send me an application, and it just doesn't work. The way they market it is you go to the computer store, you buy a starter kit, and it gives you an instruction manual and a list of all the cities and phone numbers and everything. Okay, well, maybe that's an, yeah. An initial uh, charge or, or? Other than buying the starter kit for the 20 bucks or whatever it cost me, that, that was it. And that's the way they market their first hour or two of computer time. Yeah, you have a question in the back. Before we move on uh, away from calendars and uh, CompuServe, have you ever contemplated uh, a network? Uh, in amateur radio, we have met where we meet once a week or we meet uh, once uh, the other week and so on and so forth. And also in CompuServe now, there are some amateur groups that are meeting on net, like every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, everybody goes to their terminal, calls up CompuServe, and passes messages back with them. Have you ever with that? Right, let me repeat the question, or, or actually um, just say that another feature that CompuServe has is just like, for example, the way amateur radio people will meet at a specific time on a specific day um, and carry on a group conversation. Um, CompuServe and, and probably the other the other companies that provide this kind of service have have tried to simulate that on the computer where you can be hooked into a conversation. Everyone logged in in this particular interest area. Uh, one guy will send a message and everyone will see it. This all happens in real time, not not like mail, which which takes takes longer. And um, the interest groups, there isn't a square dancing one yet, also provide for that kind of, um, of interaction. And no, I haven't tried that, um, but I think that would also be interesting. You get a much more immediate feel there, and you're really carrying on a conversation. Sometimes the mail gets slow. I mean, you'll send one one day and forget to log in the next day, and the next day there's a response, and, and you kind of lose your train of thought. Um, I also find that, that just sending computer mail helps me I do the correspondence immediately. It's not as easy as going to your outside U.S. mailbox and the mail kind of gets delivered whether you want it or not. You have to make an effort to go down, log in, and do it. But once you've done it, you've read the mail, there's, you're going to make a reply right then and there. You probably aren't going to put it off. And that kind of makes sure that the, the mail keeps flowing rather than, than the correspondence stopping. Any other comments, or should I move on a little bit? Okay. Do you have anything to add, Pat, by the way? I don't know. No? Okay. Um, Okay, number six, everyone's heard about uh, so-called the computer numbers or computer squares. Um, I'm not quite sure where the, where the term came from. Um, there's a couple of different ways in which computers can be used to aid in mixing dancers. Um, one thing, just the mathematical problem of, and I've also heard it re referred to as, as in, in the golf context of here you have, you want to put together these foursomes, they're going to go out golfing every, every week for a while, and they don't want to golf in the same foursome until they've golfed with all the other golfers. Same thing with square dancing. Um, just that mixing problem, how do you do it? I give you 16 couples. How many tips can you go before someone has to dance with someone else? That's a mathematical problem, and there's mathematical solutions. There's also computer solutions by trial and error and just saying, well, let's take this and see if we can interchange two couples and make the mix better, and we'll keep doing that until we can't do it anymore. Um, there have been computer programs written to generate these number systems. Um, typically, the computer-generated ones come out better than the hand-generated ones. So there's some commercially available um, computer square mixing things which are done by hand that just aren't very good and if after a while your dancers know that hey you know these numbers just aren't great and the computer ones come out better um, that's where the mixing is done one shot statically and then published there are some callers um, who either in their own square dance hall or sometimes bring the equipment with them have a program which will do the mixing at the dance and this is great because it means they're immune to uh, well, this couple left the dance early, another one came in, and typically even the, the statically done, you know, done once um, mixes are not very reliable in the face of change. So it's great if you have 27 couples at your dance and you have 27 couples all the way through, but using numbers where more dancers come in and other dancers leave and this one wants to sit out, the, the numbers just don't have the, the flexibility there, whereas the computer does. And... Um, I didn't talk to, but people mentioned to me that there are some callers who, who do have the, um, the systems like that. I know there is one commercially available that you see advertised in American Square Dance Magazine. Um, 
The other thing about numbers is how you present them to the dancers. One way to do it is you have a big chart up front and everyone has to come up and look at it. A way that, that Don Beck suggested to me is why not give them each a slip of paper that no matter how many couples are at the dance, the slip of paper has all the information you need. And I use the computer to take someone else's database and reformat it and print it out in the way I wanted to see it. Um, and I currently have sets of numbers like that. And, and I've been giving, a, giving a, a master away free to anybody who, who's interested, and they can make copies and laminate them or not laminate them and throw them away at the end of the dance or not throw them away. Uh, it's up to them. I couldn't figure out a good way to market it, so I just figured that, you know, let the most people have it who want it. Um, okay. Any questions on the, uh, on the number system stuff? Great. Now, the rest of the topics, let's see, oh, some of these are okay. Uh, I was going to say, a lot of what I do was generated by my interest in challenge dancing and choreography, and what could the computer do to help me there? And I know in general that's not necessarily of interest to, to everybody, so I, I kind of wanted to not, not say quite as much there unless I get more questions. Um, number seven, automatically generate square dance sequences. I think that, that this is something that a, a lot of callers I've talked to have, have suggested, hey, this would be neat. Um, I know other people other than I have done. Um, the sequences typically don't turn out great, um, even if you try to pay attention to proper use of hands, flow, what calls legal from one call following another call, and make the computer properly resolve the sequence at the end, you're still stuck with a lot of intangibles that, that make dancing dancing rather than, than kind of little robots marching through the squares. Um, things like dancers aren't interested in doing a do -so do four times in a row, usually. Um, if you call dive through, you might not want to say center's partner trade because you know you might say well that's bad flow or there's something wrong with it it's hard to make a computer understand what's wrong with that I mean the guys walk certainly I can pass through in partner trade and the guy's just walking forward isn't he and how do you know that well maybe on dive through he had to duck under something so if you add that concept to it it just gets pretty complicated um, I don't know anyone who's successfully come up with a computer program that generates sequences that he uses on a day-to-day -day basis yeah a question in the back The statement was that, that um, uh, one particular caller finds that often the sequences he writes by hand, when he actually goes out and tries them, they don't end up being as, as good with flow and body mechanics as he had expected, and you end up throwing those away too. So in that sense, the computer's no different. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, that raises the question of, well, could you have a computer program that does a little bit better than you, that maybe doesn't write the material, but if you gave it some material, it could tell you where it's good and where it's bad. Um, and the computer is good at keeping track of lots of little details like how much body flow all the men and all the women have, how much turning they've done, um, and, and um, it could add up those numbers very easily and at least give you some hints, and then you can use your judgment to decide, I'll, I'll accept the fact that it thinks this, this lady turned around too many times and is getting dizzy, or, or that this guy had a, was walking forward and then had to dodge backwards to the right, and that that feels awkward. Um, I think that has some, some potential. In addition, it would be very easy for it to keep track of what calls are on what level, whereas it might be hard for, for a caller to do that, or at least it seems that way from some dances. Um, um, okay, we can touch back on that thing a bit more. Um, yeah? Uh, I can't really, I can't intelligently There was uh, someone, I don't know who, had a computer on display, and he had a program running on the computer, and little dancing figures would actually... Right, I know what you're talking about. I'll hit that in just a second. I think I know what that is, because there's a Chicago area dancer that, that, that has, I think, the thing you're talking about. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Um, on number eight, resolve tables, when everyone has to stick endings on the sequences that they write by hand. Um, typically at mainstream or advanced, there's not as much call for writing material by hand unless you're trying to do, for, for example, singing call figures. Um, at the challenge level, I, I have to write a lot of sequences. Um, I'm just not that interested when I've written a sequence of putting a clever ending on it. I don't want to look and say, gee, is it going to take a motivate to get me to my corner, a swing the fractions, you know, what, what call is going to do it? So I had a computer that would exhaustively from every, from a set of 20 or 30 common formations, no matter where the dancers were, and there happens to be 384 symmetric ways you can stick eight dancers into lines of four facing, and there's 384 types of right-hand ocean waves, for example. No matter where they were, it would find the shortest way out for each of the different levels, C1, C2, C3, C4, and I guess I did a couple of special ones for advanced, although it wasn't as good there. Ignored flow, ignored proper use of hands. It didn't know what call you called first before you're going to go for this resolve, but it knew for the calls it knew how to do, it was the shortest. And I make heavy use of that table. Whenever I write a sequence, I'll... Um, I'll, I'll look it up on the table. In fact, I have a computer program that looks up on the table automatically for me now, so I don't even have to worry about it. I type my material into the computer, and at the end I say I'm in a right-hand ocean wave, and reading across the bottom, it's one lady, one man, two lady, two man. What's the shortest resolve? Hit Piper R, it resolves the sequence, fills in the lines. I don't even have to type it anymore. That works great for me. I don't think it's something that's, that's applicable to everybody. Um, other people who don't write material but who are site callers who say, well, I kind of always have boring endings. I'm not good at getting to right and left grands, and I haven't really done my homework, and can you suggest some other ways to do it? What they were interested in is, well, let's say you take um, 1P, 2P lines or, or zero lines, you know, lines, head, step, right, make a line type thing. Um, give me 50 different ways of getting out of that at the advanced level. And I haven't done this, but people have asked me for it and I'd like to work on it when I have a chance, you know, and just have the computer generate those. And you can throw away 25 because you know they're garbage or they're the ones you've heard, but it might come up with some other ways that are pretty interesting that resolve immediately to right and left brands or promenade homes if you like, you know, um, you know, tag the line left, promenade home. And hey, that's, that, that might be interesting because you don't often resolve directly to a promenade. So those are some things with resolve tables. Any computer program that understands and can manipulate choreography, I think, is, is a really powerful tool. It's just that that's a very hard program to write. My goal is to get it to help me do C3 and C4, and if it did that, it would certainly be able to do mainstream pretty well. But even doing mainstream is tough, um, and a lot of the problems you have to solve for mainstream apply to the upper levels, too. Um, okay. Oh, look at all these. Okay, zeros and equivalents, once you have a computer program that understands choreography in some sense, and my, under, my computer's understanding of choreography is very simple. It, it's what I call um, just a state transition table. It says, if you're in right-hand ocean waves like this and the call is swing through, then the ending position's here, and I have no idea how you got there. Um, that was the easiest way for me to enter choreography into the computer. And, and since it has no idea how it got there, I had to say, and by the way, the ending flow for the ends is standing still and for the new centers is, is arm turning by the left, for example. And they turned half just in case you want to call fan the top next and, and, and watch out for overflow. Um, so once I have all this database built up, um, zeros and equivalents are pretty easy. You can just have the computer go through and find these things. Um, and you find out some interesting things and a lot of things that, that you already knew. Um, I guess last year I had a list of some of those. I don't have that with me now. Okay, convention programming. Um, John Sobolski helped the New England convention some. I've heard other people helping other conventions doing scheduling. It's kind of like the, the classic problem in, of school scheduling of classes in a, in a high school and all the students and so forth. That's a pretty tough program. A lot of big computers have computed on it for a while. Um, John happened to use a, a relatively large computer to do the, the New England convention one. Um, but the important point is, is that even if the computer doesn't do the actual scheduling, it's good at keeping track of all the details. Often at a convention you hear the problem, of, oh, look, I scheduled into this hall and I have 10 minutes to get all the way across town over there. Well, the computer can know for every caller, if someone enters it, um, what their requests were. So you can sort it by that and make sure that every caller gets his first request first and then his second request second so you don't get some guy who got all three requests filled. Uh, at least that's the way we did it in New England. Um, and 
once they have assignments, even if the assignments were generated by hand, it can still make sure that the travel time isn't, isn't too much, that, the, um, that there aren't any other conflicts. And the computer is great at keeping track of these kind of details. Now, this would be a special purpose program that someone would have to write. Um, I wrote down a while ago, I wanted to talk about databases. Um, there are some programs you can buy that are good doing database manipulation. If you just enter a bunch of records, here's a guy's name, there's this, there's this field, there's this field. You can say sort it by this, sort it by that, print it out by this. So for all the guys who have the same field here, add up what number he has. Um, those kind of programs can, can go a long way. It's, you can buy one. It's not special purpose programming. And I imagine you could even do some of the convention programming and scheduling just using a commercially available database program. Um, Pat touched on color analysis. I haven't done much more of that. Um, I guess I'd like to. It didn't take me very long to type in somebody's dance. You come up with your own abbreviations. I don't think we need to standardize on what abbreviations everyone uses because the computer can just expand whatever you use out into your words and then back into my words if I wanted to, if it was a problem. Um, so you type in all the sequences, and right off the bat, you can get simple counts. How many right and left throughs did the guy do? And then what you really want to know is, well, how many right and left throughs does a really good caller use? or you know, someone who you respect. Um, if you can get a tape of his dance, you can see how you compare to him. And you don't want the whole country to sound all the same, like all the uh, airline pilots when they make their announcements. But, but you, would like, uh, you would like to find out if you're overusing a certain call, if you're supposed to be calling a plus dance. How many plus calls did you really end up calling? And is that what your goal was? Um, even simple counts like this are, are easy to get on the computer and are very revealing. The hard part is not getting it. The hard part is saying, well, I call too many up to the middle and backs. How do I cut some of those out? It's like being in color school where the guy says, well, we want you to call the next tip, site called, without any circulates. And that's really tough because you get into patterns. It's always right and left through and flutter wheel. Or how do you set up a, something that flows to a Dixie style to an ocean wave without doing a right and left through before it? Because that's the only way you ever do it. Um, that leads into the second part is it's easy to have the, co the computer compute call A followed by call B, and how many times do those frequencies happen? So you can say, what calls do I use before Dixie style to an ocean wave? And if it's always the same call, maybe that's boring. If it's right and left through Dixie style to an ocean wave, you know, why didn't they give that the name rather than Dixie style to an ocean wave if it's always that? Um, and I think the habits are hard to break and the modification is tough, but you can... Um, have the computer come up with this stuff. It's not too hard to program. I think it's pretty useful. I think that's one of the more interesting um, things that, that's available to everybody. The dancer training was the question that, that you asked about. Um, a guy who works for Bell Labs, who, who is a good computer hardware hacker, um, you know, he can invent his own computer, or put a microprocessor chip to work for him on his own board, uh, made the following piece of hardware uh, that you really can't buy anywhere else, and it would be hard for you to duplicate, um, but it was interesting, and he has had it on display in a couple of places. It had a joystick, a little thing as you move it, and this was better than most joysticks, like what you see on your Atari game, is if you turn the top, the computer knew that too. So you could move it around, and you could turn the top. And on the TV display screen was... was two dancers. It was man number one and his opposite, man number three. And you thought you were man number one. And as you move the joystick, man number one would move all over the screen. As you turn it, then he'd turn. And, and he was nice to you. He made the turns kind of go in increments, so you didn't have to be real careful about that. And I had a tape recorder. And he had a recorded dance. He wanted to learn how to do advanced and challenge and so forth and didn't have suitable workshops to go to. He's just a dancer. Um, so what he did is he'd take a tape of an advanced dance and kind of memorize some of the calls, and then he'd try to dance man number one without any other dancers through the sequence, and the computer would memorize what he did. So maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. It, it took a lot of practice. Um, and then he'd move, he'd rewind the tape and do, do it again. This time he'd be man number three. And he'd see man number one moving around the screen while he's doing man number three. So he added in much the way people make uh, uh, records where you record multiple tracks and overlay one track and the other. He laid in another track, which was man number three. And then he did lady number one and, I'm sorry, man one, man two, lady one, lady two, typically. And then he had a whole square. Well, they, if he made mistakes in the beginning, you could see where they were kind of jerky and he got the position wrong, and they could walk on top of each other because it had no idea. It was just moving little graphics around. It didn't know anything. But it looked pretty good. And then for helping other people learn, he would 
take the whole thing and take away man number one, and you could play the tape and have all the other dancers going, and you'd be man number one and try to move through it. That's, that's primarily what he had done. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. I tried using it some. It's, it's just like moving checkers. When you say to a dancer or a caller who hasn't tried that, hey, here's a sequence, push the checkers through it, and they go, well, I've never used checkers before. You know, this is pretty tough, and you, know, you aren't used to thinking in that manner. And the same thing with this machine. Uh, it's not clear how much of that transfers over. Just because you're good at, at you know, playing Atari with the dancers, can you, um, can you really dance the stuff yourself? And this particular guy is a, is a very good dancer, and he can do it. But I'm not sure that that would necessarily be a great way to train, to train people. Um, I know any questions on that or, or other comments? Okay. Uh, 13, something we've kind of touched on, mainstream by the numbers, people who would like to be able to have a computer that could, um, you type in the number of a call or the name of a call and it would do it on the screen. All the people I talked to on the phone and here at the convention, I asked them the following question. I says, everyone says they'd like to have a computer help them with choreography. But I really don't know what a computer would do to help you with choreography. What is it that you want? Most callers I talk to don't use checkers. They don't prepare for dances because they're a psych call. They just get up and, and psych call. They might look up what the latest and greatest call in the note service is or the call lab quarterly selection. What's a computer going to do for you with respect to, um, to choreography? And, and I phrase that two ways. One is, you know, just what do you do now or what do you imagine? And secondly, let's say I could write any program in the world for you to help you. You know, I can understand mainstream. You could talk to it. You know, who knows what? And what kind of imagination do you have and, and where do you think that could lead you? Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of applications. Uh, the best one I heard was a person who works out advanced singing call figures because he doesn't see them very often at the advanced level. He wants to workshop the new call that he taught. And, and, and make sure he uses it in, in the advanced singing call. The singing calls have to time out right, and, and he has to make sure he gets the calls there. And something, that's where he uses checkers to work out those sequences. Other callers use checkers just to um, look at a new call and understand the body flow and so forth in it. Um, I don't know if there's other ideas out there. Um, I, actually, I, I think this might be a good time just to, to get a little more feedback from the audience of what, you know, if we had a computer program that was pretty good with, with material, what would you like to see it do if it understood mainstream choreography? You know, is it important to you that you see the dancer move very smoothly on the screen through the whole movement, or is it just fine to jump from the beginning to the ending place, for example? I don't know. Um, actually, if I'm going to do this, I have a mic up here, and it'd be good instead of me repeating your questions if we could, could get them on tape. Is there anybody who has anything they would like to talk about for a bit on that subject? Ah. What if I don't make you use the microphone and I'll repeat it? <laughs> nope? Yeah. Okay, good. Let's see if I can... Uh As usual, state your name. I'm Aaron Gordon. Uh, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I think it would be nice if the to work a uh, sequence backwards. Unlike Clark, I like to have creative endings, and um, not just any ending. And so what I would like is maybe a uh, spin the top to a right and left grand. And what is, if I want that, what is the square got to look like before that? What do I have to have the dancers to be able to call that? So it would be nice to put them at the end of, of what I want and say, if I call the spin the top to right and left grand, where would this have come from? So I actually do the choreography backwards. That sounds good. Are there any other uh, people who have some ideas of what a computer could do choreographically for you? Randy Tans, uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin. I think what I'd like to do, like when you're learning new levels, I'm uh, right now I'm trying to learn to call advanced, and uh, I'm working with figures. And when I write figures in mainstream, I can write you know, plus dance or a mainstream dance with my checkers in 30 minutes. I can write a whole dance. I don't write every single figure, but I write sequences and enough different sequences for a whole dance in 30 minutes. But in advance, it might take me six hours, eight hours, 24 hours to do the same thing because I'm not as familiar with the material. I don't know the ending positions. So what I'd like the computer to do for me is, let's say, generate a singing call sequence or something like that for a particular call that I'm not as familiar with. And maybe I might also want to dictate to the computer, hey, use this call and that call. They're both advanced calls in one sequence, and then use whatever else you want. It'll give me a, a fairly short sequence in so many beats that'll give me uh, a nice flowing dance. That's what I'd like it to do for me. 
do you think that in some ways that's a shortcut for you having to do your homework? I mean, are absolutely. We gonna... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, part of the use of a computer, in my opinion, is you know saving time, and where it might take me eight hours to write my workshop for advanced. If I could cut that down to two hours, I'm saving myself time, and I can do other things in that time. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else who has any comments they'd like to make? Yeah. Hold on. How much memory are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, now we're getting down to some specific, and specifics. And then you go into cost. If you, you know. Right. One, one question would be, if we had such a computer and program, how much memory would it be? How much would it cost? Is it really anything thing people can contemplate today if you go out and buy a computer for a couple thousand bucks? Um, That's a, that's a hard question. Um, my approach in any of the stuff I've done, uh, remember my background's from MIT, I had nice big computers to use, I had fairly good facilities, is when I have to solve a hard problem, and, and I think this really is a hard problem, I think a lot of people underestimate it. A lot of people have, have said, gee, Clark, why don't you write a program that does this or does that? And I don't think they realize how difficult it is until they start doing it themselves and realize that, hey, they've got three calls in, but the method they're using would only expand up to 10 before they used as much memory as you can buy in the world or something. Um, when I solve a hard problem, I use the biggest and best computer and the best tools I can use completely without regard for how much disk, how much memory, and how slow it runs just to get the problem solved. Once you know the solution, the second time through and the third time through, you can always do it better. Um, people who do video games have real constraints on how much speed, how much memory, and what they can do. And the video games are pretty amazing for the amount of memory they have, and they don't usually have disks in them either. Um, I think you could get a program that could do mainstream and plus, where you could type in the names of the calls, and it could it could at least show you before and after positions. Maybe it wouldn't show you it moving through um, in today's computers. But I don't think there's a lot of people around who could program that and who could take the time. Part of the problem is is that if I do it on my computer, it might take me, if I got lucky, you know, a week's worth of solid work. Whereas if I had to then put it on an IBM PC or something where the programming environment isn't as good and there's more constraints and there's so much more to worry about, it's going to take me a lot longer. It might take me months to do that. And currently, at least for me personally, I haven't felt that it's worth my time to try that. In fact, I haven't solved the problem on the big computer yet, so, you know. Um, let's go through the other things quickly. I, want, I was hoping to get more discussion. I got this feeling I'm standing up here talking and people are walking out the back of the door, so that's not great. Um, I just have a couple more things mentioned. The permuted index, for anybody who's writing new choreography, if you wanted to know what the word neighbor really meant, and maybe you didn't do advanced and challenge, but you wanted to find all the calls in the world that had the word neighbor in it, a permuted index will take, let's say the calls follow your neighbor. It'll list it under follow, just like a normal index, but also list it under neighbor. And you probably give it your, isn't, all the calls have the word your in it isn't very interesting, so you'd probably um, just tell it not to do that, and the, and and, and a, and so forth. But neighbor is interesting, and finding a list of all the calls that have neighbor in it, it'd be cross your neighbor, crisscross your neighbor, follow your neighbor, trade your neighbor, and you could try to see if there's a pattern there, and if you're inventing a new, inventing a new neighbor call, maybe it would fit in with whatever pattern's already there that you weren't previously aware of. Um, I know a couple of people who write calls who, who make use of a permuted index I, I generated a long time ago. Um, I should really update it. Uh, the master database, I have a database, and other people have been starting to do things like this that has, for every call written, I mean, a lot of the data that you, if you look in the call lab handout, there's a thing that shows all the plus calls and when they were invented and, and, and so forth, and for all the calls in the mainstream list, what date they were invented and by who. Um, and, and it says some of that was researched by Don Beck. Well, when Don needs to ask a question like that, he comes to me. I have asked the computer, gee, where did it get written? I went through, for example, um, Lloyd Littman's Instant Hash and every call in there that has a date and an author, that's in the database. All the calls in Burleson, they're in the database. Um, all the calls in the note services I get, Bill Peters, Bill Davis's note service, I type in the author and the date. Um, any extra information I get, like the call lab handout this time had some more dates, some more authors, I'll go back and make sure that I know that. And I'm slowly accumulating all the knowledge I can um, about all the score dance calls, their authors, the year written, um, and where the source reference was so I could go back and look it up if I wanted to. Um, that's just a big text file. That's pretty big. You know, does that fit on a floppy disk? Well, I don't know. I haven't had to try that, but, but that's a big file, um, but at least it's being done somewhere. Um, survey analysis. Legacy does surveys. Lots of people do surveys. Um, computers are good at analyzing that kind of stuff. Uh, Bill Davis does his uh, 
Um, he'll record some big festivals and dances and just find out what the frequencies of the calls are. He has an interesting idea that the way the list should be done is in order of decreasing frequency of call, not in any other order. Um, of course, that violates a lot of things like, well, you should teach this before that. But his point is is that the, the calls that dancers are going to hear is what you should be teaching them. <laughs> and if you go out and record you know, realistic dances like a big festival or some guy's workshop or whatever, whatever you feel is realistic, that's the, the order the call should be taught in because that's what they're going to hear. And, and that's a pretty radical uh, approach to, to how to decide what calls are on what level and which ones we teach in what order. Um, and I had a couple of sky and or uh, blue sky ideas at the end. The one was the traveling caller booking we talked about. Um, the challenge caller's apprentice is the thing I want, which will move my checkers for me so I don't have to dance every sequence twice on checkers, which takes me a long time. Um, I thought of some other ideas as I get lazy in my old age of, uh, well, if we could have a computer program to generate challenge choreography, you know, maybe mainstream's too hard, but challenge choreography might not be as tough. There's more calls to use. There's less chance of it doing a million dosa dos in a row because it just has so many calls to choose from. Um, and another thing I thought of is maybe something that's kind of like, uh, you know, hamburger extender where I write most of a sequence and it can fill out a little bit of extra stuff. Or what if I were to type in a lot of Lee Cotman sequences and say, generate some more that sound like Lee Cotman? Right? You know, it could say, well, I know that from here after Walk and Dodge, he 99% of the time does a tag the line or 10% you know, of the time does tag the line. Just generate more sequences based on the frequencies it saw in his old sequences and, or, or my old sequences or something. And that's an interesting thing to think about. Of, could I make a program? You know, caller's material, you can tell who's calling it if you take two or three guys. Could I make something that could, where the computer could turn out more of the same, um, or especially for a caller like Jimmy Davis who's, who stopped calling in at least my area? you know, in the challenge levels, and it'd be real neat to be able to get some more Jimmy Davis material, but we just can't because he doesn't call anymore. Um, that That's something that, that's kind of a pie-in-the-sky idea. Everyone complains about duplicate calls. You know, hey, they just reinvented, I don't know, there's lots of examples of it, um, only it has a different name now. Well, that's pretty hard to find. You can't afford to look through Burleson and make sure every definition's not the same as the one you just invented. But if the computer knows the starting and ending formation and the, the effect on the square of every single call, you could have it say, here are the calls that have the same effect as yours. For example, spin chain through is the same as tally ho. And then you'd be limited to four or five calls to make sure the action in the middle isn't the same. That's not, um, that's not that blue sky. It's just that it takes an awful lot of effort to enter, to enter every square dance call in existence into what its starting position is and what its ending position is. And I don't know that the payback is really worth the effort. I mean, people complain about duplicate calls, but it doesn't seem like they really care all that much, especially if the call isn't in use at all. Computerized note service, I thought it might be neat using CompuServe or something if you can find out what the new calls are get your choreography that way. It's much more immediate. It might even be easier on the guy generating it if all of his subscribers had it. But again, you've got to wait till a lot of people have um, computers. And finally, this other one, five, something where I could just, to get practice mic time, if I could just call into something and watch the dancers move on a screen, that'd be great for a caller school and for callers practice. You wouldn't have to waste your first square of dancers uh, or something like that. But as I say, that's pretty pie in the sky. Um, I'd like to get some more discussion and feedback from you guys, um, either more, more questions from both of us or, or ideas of your own or other applications I've missed on or something like that. Let's see if I can just bring this over. Oh, great. I'm Ray Duval from Hollis, New Hampshire. Uh, Clark, I was just wondering what kind of equipment you use. Um, when I was at MIT, we had a VAX computer that's made by DEC. Um, it's a popular computer that a lot of colleges and, and, and maybe high schools have. And we were running the Unix operating system, and all the programming I did was in the C language. Um, the company I work for now makes its own computers. They're, the company's name is Symbolics. They're, they run the Lisp language. It's mainly an artificial intelligence thing. Um, I moved to the company because my belief was using current computers and commercial languages, I just didn't have enough power and enough days in the week to write the programs I needed to write. And any aid that the people who do artificial intelligence work could give me in terms of programming tools would be good. And, and I have hopes that I'll be able to turn out bigger and better programs and solve some of the problems that I've mentioned that I don't know anyone who's solved here. You know, in a year or two or three when I get some time to, in a solid week, to do some writing. So. 
Uh, you also had on the back of that uh, piece of paper a fellow by the name of Aaron Gordon, I believe. Aaron's in the audience. Is he? Uh, are you using a Vax? Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to talk to you after. Thank you. I'm Breeze Graham from Belleville, Illinois. I'm computer illiterate, but I can't help but think if you would take the time providing the hardware can handle the memory, you'd take an entire year to program something that could be danceable on a screen. Uh, what do ordinary programs sell for? $150 good program? I think with that kind of time put into a program, we spend a lot of money on our equipment. It's nothing to put out $1,000 for a simple turntable. I believe there's a lot of callers in this country who'd pay $1,000 for a program if it would just simply dance on the screen. If you type in or if you call to it? Well, however you would want to put into it, you could, because that would take the place of a square. Uh -huh. And you could do all kinds of things with it. You could call a particular movement. No, this is for learning. For the learning idea. But let me make one other comment there. Um, I'm in the software business. I write a lot of programs. Something that's happened that I find very sad, and I don't think that it's going to be solved by honesty. I think it will be solved by, um, by computers, is I talk to a guy, and he says, well, and I got this great word processor, you know, Word Pro or something, just making it up. There might probably is a product by that name. Um, and... I think it's a lot better than what I've got, but I haven't quite figured out how to use it yet. And I said, well, well, why not? What about reading the manual? Well, I don't have the manual. Well, where do you get the program from? Well, I copied the disk from my friend down the road and, and so forth. Um, I think that's bad. Um, and I think a lot of people do it, and I think it's a problem that's got to be solved by the, the home computer industry somehow. Um, it'd sure be a shame if I were selling a product for a thousand bucks that did that if really the easiest thing is to go down to Joe down the street and get a copy of his. Um, there are some things that work differently, and one, I'm not really as much in, in touch with all the home computer stuff, but one guy said that what you do is you call up the source and you get freeware, free software, and you just download it on your computer and you use it. And if you like it, you send the guy 45 bucks. And if you want the user manual, it's on the computer too. So he's giving away everything for free and saying, if you like it, send me some money. And, you know, that's another way to solve it. That's pretty amazing that it works. But I think that he's in, someone said, the 10th version of his program, and it's just really expanding, and he adds new features that users request, and it's really working. And maybe that's the way of the future. I just don't know. Um, okay. Free source does work. And piracy is very bad. I agree with you. Uh, Dick Zimmer from beautiful downtown Burbank. Again? Again. Are the Housers in the room? The Housers, I'd like to talk with you after. And um, what did I want to... I wanted to add some... Oh, the program that you use for generating your computer square cards, what language is that written in? That happened to also be written in C and run on the VAX under Unix. Um, is it convertible to BASIC or compressed BASIC? I don't know. Um, the, gener the ones that generate the number systems typically require a lot of memory. You have to keep in, in your memory all at once, um, say, 100 couples, that's one dimension, multiplied by 8 tips, that's the second dimension, multiplied by um, what square number they're in, so 100 couples would be 25 squares. So 100 times 25 times 8 becomes a big number. Um, and plus however much data you store with each one. So that one's a little tough. Uh, there's another version I know written in Fortran, but again, um, I don't know how practical it is. Some of these things, I think it's very educational if you have a programming bent to do it yourself rather than trying to get another one, you know, if it, if it isn't impossible, um, because you learn a lot programming. Um, okay, go ahead. I'm Grady Green from New Mexico. Uh, I've been with the computers about eight months now, uh, not to the power that you have, but I do have a uh, personal computer at home. And I do not program, but I uh, work from software strictly and generate my stuff from that. I'm very close to what Les Hauser is doing uh, with letters, articles, round dance, cue sheets, uh, so, uh, some cataloging, names, addresses, phone numbers, mailing labels, dancing uh, things. Uh, I do have some uh, hard copy with me of things that I have done that I'll be happy to share with anybody if you would like to see what comes out and in, 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 in what I do. I think that would be great. Martin Maller from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I currently use a TRS-80 Model 3 at home. I have an MTU at the lab and a uh, Hewlett Packard 1000, which is available. I found in one of the 80 magazines a rather unique program for the fellows that don't know how to program. It's called Creator. It's sold for $12. And it is a basic program that writes basic program. 
It's a cute thing, and it does a lot of the database work that you might want. It'll write anything for cataloging records, address labels, that type of thing. And the guy has a fight going on because he went to one of the firms, this business of software and so forth. He went to sell it. They pirated it from him. And he said, the heck with that racket. And he's made it available. It's available for almost every home computer. And it's available on CPM in both 8 and 5 and a quarter inch disks. Uh, I'll see to it that it gets out in direction if you would like. And he also has given you permission. If you want to give it to a friend, go ahead. <laughs> Yep. The comment in the back was that he made it public domain. He'll send you a listing if you want to type it in yourself. Um, a couple things came to mind. I should emphasize that, especially since we kind of ended up on the more technical things, um, a caller like Johnny Wedge, who's in our area, when I talk to him, he doesn't know how to program a computer. He doesn't know how to use a computer, but he manages to get done his calendar, bookkeeping, income, and expenses and taxes on the computer. So even if you don't know how to program at all, things have gotten far enough in, in the state of home computers that you can go out and buy one, get the appropriate software, right. and figure out how to use it. You shouldn't be worried if you don't know anything about computers. It can be done, and, and, and callers are doing it. Um, I had that this session was supposed to end at 12.15. Um, there seems to be some people who might have ended early. I'm, I'm happy to go on um, for a bit more. I'd be interested to hear other feedback from, from people or questions you may have for me or Pat. Tom? Uh, Tom Potts, Massachusetts. Uh, only one warning, fellas, when you go out and get your software. Try to get something one of your friends has used. Um, some of that software has got holes in it. <laughs> and if you don't know how to program and you get in the middle and it doesn't play, there's, unless you've got a friend that's going to help you out. I've had to rewrite quite a few of the programs that I use because they just plain don't do as advertised. They come close, but they've got silly errors in them. Somebody got sloppy, but they're pushing it out trying to make a buck. So be very careful when you buy software. Either see it work in the store or talk to somebody who's using the same one and has been successful with it. People have asked me if we should have a caller lab, um, you know, computer club or something like that. Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure what that would gain. Um, I know there's a lot of users. It'd be neat for everybody to find, here's the thing I think would be useful. If as part of what, what the home office keeps track of and in, in your information thing about your name and your dues are paid and so forth, if they had a couple of extra, room for a couple of extra fields, and I haven't talked to John Kay about this, where you could put in, yes, I have a computer, this is the type, and that way if you want to know all the people who have the same kind of computer as you or just all the people who use computers in Car Lab currently, I think that would be a useful thing to keep track of. Um, I think it's good to talk to people and find out what they're doing and, and so forth. Um, I guess I'd be happy to maintain a list like what I have on the back, but I didn't get an overwhelming response from, you know, I know there's a lot more people out there with computers, and, and it's hard for me to personally contact them and, and, and dig out of them what they're doing. So I'm not sure what the right way to proceed is um, with respect to computers, square dancing, and, and, and Color Lab itself. I don't know if anyone has any ideas on that. <laughs>